This is Jim Clay, Perfection Turkey Calls. Today we're going to talk with you a little bit about using the diaphragm call, and how to use it, the development, the history of the call, and the various uses of the call. Um, first, we're going to let Tom talk about the development and the various uses of the diaphragm. Tom? Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> One of the reasons for the development of the diaphragm turkey call was the hunter's need for a call which he could use without movement. As most of you are aware, the turkey does have extremely keen eyesight and he usually picks up any movement in the woods before he picks up colors or other outlines in the woods. So this was the main reason for the development of the diaphragm call. Also, while we were developing the call, we found that it does free your hands or freeze the hunter's hands so that he can hold his gun or camera or bow. We at Perfection produce five different calls. Each call has a little bit different pitch and we vary the pitch by changing the rubber reed or the diaphragm within the call. We can go from a single to a double to a triple diaphragm. As you change diaphragms, you change the pitch a little bit. Thus, within the range of calls that we make, you do have the possibilities of producing almost any call that a wild turkey can produce. It gives you a variety of pitches and a variety of sounds. One thing that you do need to be aware of is that the rubber reed of the diaphragm call can be easily damaged or destroyed. One of the biggest defects that we find as far as damage to the rubber reed is putting it in direct sunlight or in heat. We suggest that when you're not using this call that you store it in a dark cool place, preferably the butter tray of the refrigerator. Also, while carrying the call in the woods, you will find that a lot of the dirt and dust that you accumulate in your pockets of your hunting coats and pants get on the diaphragm. So we suggest that you find some type of a carrying case or some type of protection for the calls while you're hunting in the woods. While there are several advantages of using a diaphragm call, you will find that it is not the easiest call on the market to use. It takes considerable amount of practice in order to become proficient in using the diaphragm call. However, because your hands are free, you can practice while you're driving down the road to work or when you're doing other chores around the house. You still have an opportunity to, protect, to practice using the diaphragm call. As we go into this tape, we're going to give you some of the basic instructions on calling with a mouth yelper or the diaphragm type call. And we'll also get into hunting strategy and hunting tips. And while we're doing this, we hope to improve your success in both of these areas. At this time, Jim will begin with the beginning diaphragm user and showing him how to get first sounds and then develop these into the basic sounds of the wild turkey. Okay, basically what we want to do when we first start to use the diaphragm, we want to think about positioning the call in the proper place in the mouth first thing we tell people to do is to run their tongue back across the top of their mouth until you get to the soft part in the back. That's your soft palate. Now come up a little bit in front of that, about halfway between the soft palate and the teeth on the hard palate, and that's where you want to position the call. Just about halfway between the teeth and the soft palate. Put the open end of the call, or the open end of the horseshoe, toward the front of the mouth and position the call in the top of the, the top of the mouth. Um, the first thing, another thing you need to know is that the end of the tape will give you an air seal on the top of your mouth. All this air, all the air must come between your tongue and the diaphragm. And you huff the air from your chest in a huff, huff note rather than a whoof. If you don't bring the air from the chest, you won't get much success with the diaphragm call. We sometimes tell people to call with the word system using such words as chirp, or quit, anything which makes the call work. I'll give you a couple examples of that in a second, but remember, once again, the, tongue, the call must be positioned properly, it must be in the top of the mouth, and it must be about halfway back. The air must be huffed from the chest. Okay, I'll give you some examples of some first sounds you might achieve off of a diaphragm call. I realize that doesn't sound much like a turkey. It sounds more like a, a ruptured goose or something of that nature. But what's going to happen is once you get that initial sound, you can modify that sound so it sounds like a turkey. And you don't want to let this um, 
initial problem with using the call bother you. Some people learn to use one in five minutes. Some people learn to use one in five days. It depends on the individual. All the air goes between the tongue and the diaphragm. If the call tickles your tongue, tighten your tongue up on the call and push the call harder against the top of your mouth. Uh, general rule, the more air you blow, the harder you blow it, the louder the call will be. Um, the first thing you need to know is you need to know the initial sounds, the initial sounds a turkey might make. And the two basic calls we like to talk about are the yelp and the cluck. And the cluck is probably easier to make than the yelp. You, we use the word system again with the cluck. Put the call on the top of the mouth and say the word put. Probably the, is the easiest word to say. Or pull the tongue down like you have peanut butter stuck on the top of your mouth. I'll do both of those, either one of which will make a, a nice cluck, a nice resonant cluck for you. First I'll say the word put and achieve a cluck that way. Then I'll use the tongue and kind of chuck it down from the top of the mouth. As I, again, both of these are clucks. That was saying the word put. Now I'll pull my tongue off the top of my mouth again like I have peanut butter stuck on it. A little bit of difference in pitch and tonation, but basically the same call. Now as we go into the to the yelp. And we're talking about now the very basic calls, you know, basic starting to use a diaphragm call. But as, as we go into more advanced calling, we'll explain in more detail. The yelp is a two-part note. It's a little key yelp, a key on the first of it, and then it turns over into a yelp, yelp, yelp type thing. And I'll show that to you on the diaphragm. So the yelp is always that two-part note. It gets faster. Now, you don't have to call that fast to call turkeys, obviously. It can be more of a... And it doesn't have to be a real quick type call. But to eventually master the mouth call, what we're looking for is, is control, complete control of the air. And when you completely control the air and run the air just the way you want to run it over the diaphragm, you can run that real fast note. Some of the other basic calls are the whine and the purr and the tree up. I'll let Tom kind of cover the whine and the purr for you, and I'll come back for the tree up. <coughs> the whine and the purr are close in calls to use when turkey hunting. Once the turkey comes into sight, the whine is a real soft call. It's a one note sound, and it's made by just forcing a small amount of air over the diaphragm and it'll sound something similar to this. But this will vary. Jim can make the whine for you, and his might sound completely different from mine, so Jim will try it for you. Purr is just an extenuation of the whine, and it's made one of two ways. I do it with my throat. It's similar to gargling. If you ever had a sore throat and had to gargle, you know that you have to use your throat to do this. And you're using your throat, you're going... At the same time, you have the call in your mouth. So the purr, using the throat to make the purr, will sound something like this. It also can be done using the lips, similar to playing motorboat or
playing motor like you when you did when you were a child. This is the way Jim does it, and it also sounds real good in the woods. Okay, again, as Tom says, you purse the lips and, and blow forcefully and like a little kid playing motorboat or whatever. If you've got any children, I'm sure you've heard them make that sound. And you make a whine at the same time, and it comes out to sound like this. We tell almost everyone to use calls in sequence, and we'll get more into sequence calling in a few minutes. Well, that was a, uh, a purr with a few clucks thrown in. Turkeys make this noise periodically all day long when they're with the flock or they're feeding along. They'll, they'll make that noise very low sometimes, and it's sort of an okay call when it's made in that tone. It's, it's an okay. Things are all right. You don't worry about it. Uh, the next call we like to do, comment on is a tree yelp, and probably the first thing a turkey does in the morning when he pulls his head up on his wing and sitting on the roots looking all around, making sure things are okay as a tree yelp. They do it very low and the cadence is very slow. It's, it's not excited. It's kind of a wake up call. I and mean, when you get out of bed in the morning you don't jump up and down and yell and scream and the birds don't either. But this is the, about the first thing they do when they get up in the morning. I'll let Tom hit a few licks on this tree yelp and then I'll jump in there also. Usually we talk about a sequence anywhere from two to five yelps, slowly, very soft. Uh, you probably shouldn't be able to hear it over 75 or 80 yards at the longest distance. A gobbler can hear it probably 150 or 75 yards without any problem. One of the things we always tell people, if, if you're calling and trying to call a turkey and you make a mistake, don't quit calling. And the turkeys don't quit when they make a mistake. They make hundreds of them. I'll put the best turkey call in the country up against any turkey. Turkeys will make three or four times more mistakes than he will. But that you have to realize that, that the humans are going to practice their call a whole lot more than the wild birds do. So if you make a mistake, come on back with a whole series of good calls and, and don't worry about it. Okay, that is our basic series of calls that we refer to. When we talk about basic calling, that's what we're talking about. The cluck, the yelp, the whine, purr, and the tree yelp. You can use those calls and call in birds 95% of the time. The rest of it is sort of icing on the cake. We'll cover that when we get to the more advanced calling in a few minutes. Right now, uh, Tom's going to talk to you a little bit about spring calling, uh, hunting, locating birds, and so forth. And I'll come back in in a few minutes when we talk about fall hunting. We'll both do a little bit more calling for you. All right, everyone looks forward to that time in the spring when the snow melts off and the spring flowers begin to bud and they can get back into the woods in pursuit of the wild turkey gobblers. However, there are a lot of things that you need to do in preparation for spring season before you begin or even think about going into the woods. During the off season, this is an excellent time for you to be practicing using the call that you're going to be taking into the woods. It doesn't matter whether you plan to use a diaphragm call or one of the other types of calls on the market, but I think this is an excellent time for you to practice. Another thing that we try to encourage hunters to do is to do a lot of research and reading during the off season. Find articles in magazines, read books, talk to other turkey hunters, do anything that you can do to improve your skills and your knowledge of the wild turkey once you get into the woods. And then as the spring season approaches, before the actual season comes in, you need to go into the woods and put these things to test and put these things to use by doing some preseason scouting. Uh, learn the area in which the turkeys uh, are occupying, be familiar with it. Make sure that there are turkeys in the area so that when the season comes in you're not wasting your time on an unproductive area. After you've found and located turkeys in the preseason and you've practiced your calling and you've learned as much as you can about hunting during the off season, then you're ready for the actual hunt to begin. And once the hunting season actually comes in, your first task is to locate an old gobbler. 
And there are several methods that we use for doing this. One method is to go out the evening before the hunting season comes in and locate the old gobblers as they go to roost. Uh, we'll show you some methods that we use to get the turkeys to gobble here in just a minute. But uh, this preseason scouting along with putting the turkeys to roost the night before or the evening before the season comes in only help you to increase your uh, chances of success when you begin hunting as the season comes in. At this time, Jim will show you one of the methods that we use to get the old turkey to gobble in that first morning once you've gotten into the woods. And this is by using the owl call to get the turkey to respond or get the turkey to gobble back to it. Okay, as Tom said, probably the, the thing we rely on most as far as locating birds <laughs> is using the owl call. In our part of the country, we live in northern Virginia, we are blessed with a barred owl around here, and he will kind of give the old who cooks for you, who cooks for you all note. We do have a few great horned owls, but they don't sound off nearly as much as the bards do. So you can make it one of two different ways. You can make it with a natural voice, or you can make it with one of the commercially made owl calls. I'll hit the uh, commercially made call a couple of licks, and I'll let Tom owl with his natural voice. It doesn't take much practice to learn to owl. If you just... It's uh, pretty embarrassing sometimes to try to learn, but once you do learn with your natural voice, it's much easier than carrying an owl call around. Just, it's just an extra piece of luggage. Okay, so I'll hit a couple series on the owl call, and then Tom will hit a couple series with his natural voice. Okay, another method we use for locating birds, and an owl's good early in the morning or late in the evening. I haven't heard too many owls sound off in the middle of the day, but birds can be located that way. And if you can't get one to gobble any other way, you know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, try to owl to him. He might answer anyway. A crow call's good from right after daylight to right till the edge of dark. We, if we probably had to rely on one method all day long, I'd probably rely on a, a crow call more than an owl call. And get yourself a good crow call, and, and it's a little bit of an art to call in crows, but you don't have to be great to make turkeys gobble back to a crow call. But what you do have to do is get in a likely spot where they can hear you for a long way, a long distance. And, you know, crows just cut and carry on any way they want to. So I'll, I'll just cut up with a crow call a little bit. The big thing to remember about these, about these birds early on, if, if you want to find birds with a crow call and you do find them and they respond, one of the ways that the birds are a long way off, one of the ways that we keep birds gobbling is to use a crow call as we go to them rather than calling and taking a chance on stumbling upon the bird running to you while you're going to him. Just keep hitting a crow call and you can get a, a dead position on him all the time you're going to him. So I'll, I'll cut up a little bit with the crow call right now. six series of crow calls and, and maybe listen after every two or three or four notes and see if one will gobble. If it gobbles back, you've got his attention. If we can't get anything to gobble with either the crow call or the owl call, uh, we might use a gobbler tube, a shaky gobbler tube at him and try to make him sound off so we can get a location on him. Okay, Tommy's going to go back again to some of the basic spring calls and talk to you about them. If you had a good vantage point and you tried to howl and you tried to crow and you got no response, from there, you would want to move one direction or the other away from where you were, maybe 150, 200 yards, and try the same thing again. Again, it depends on the type of terrain you're hunting in, but it might be hills and ridges and trees and so forth that are blocking out the sounds that you're making where the turkey can't hear these. So move and try this again if you're not getting any response. But assuming that a turkey did gobble back to you, you probably ask the question now, what's the next thing I do? The next thing that we try to do once a turkey has responded to the owl or the crow or maybe he gobbled on his own is we want to be in a position where we're close enough to work the turkey or to call to the turkey. We like to be within 100 to 150 yards of the gobbler while he's still on the roost 
on the same level or slightly above where he is roosting. This way, when he comes out of the tree, uh, it seems to me the turkeys are kind of reluctant to go downhill when they come off the roost. They like to go uphill. That way, if something scares them, they are, have an easier flight when they try to flush or when they try to get away from whatever might uh, frighten them. We like to face downhill in approximately the direction that the turkey is gobbling from. And sometimes we set up with our gun pointing a little bit to the right, uh, being right-handed. It, easier, it's easier for you to swing to the left if you're right-handed with your gun if you'd happen to circle around come in from the left side. However, if you were facing the left and he swings around to your right, you being right-handed, it's hard for you to get the gun around. So try to have all the advantages you can as the turkey approaches and facing a slightly to the right if you're a right-handed person or slightly to the left if you're a left-handed person does give you some advantage. We try to find a tree or a rock or a stump or something that's at least as large as we are and we can put our back against this. There are two reasons for doing this. One, it breaks the outline of your body and makes your camouflage work a lot better. Also, it protects your back. If another hunter happened to be coming through the woods, you can spot him fairly easily if he's coming from the front of you. But someone approaching from the back, if you're not protected, they might mistake you from a turkey. And we're going to get into hunter safety a little bit later in the tape. But sit with your back to some large ob object to break up your outline. Find a comfortable position. You don't know, you might have to hold one position for a half an hour or longer while the turkey is working his way into you. Uh, they don't always come on a run in a straight line to you. Sometimes they take circular paths or they'll come and stop and hang up and then they'll come a little further and then they'll wait a little while and they'll come again. But you don't know how long it's going to take this turkey to work his way into where he'll be within range. So find some position that's going to be comfortable. Uh, sometimes people sit with one knee propped to help support the gun or maybe both knees propped up where they can help support the gun. But if you're holding the gun in a ready position for 15 or 20 minutes, it's almost impossible to hold the gun steady and to hold it in that position. Later in the tape too, we'll talk about camouflage clothing, but it is very important that you be completely camouflaged. And as we said, by sitting with your back to the larger trees, you will find that this helps break up your outline where the turkeys are not going to see you. All right, now that you've heard the turkey, maybe he's come down out of the roost, or maybe he's still in the roost gobbling, you're set up in a position where you think you can begin working the bird. The first call that we begin with, we covered earlier, is the tree call. And this is just a real soft yelp to let the gobbler know that there is another turkey in his area. If you were to sit there and not make any sounds at all, he might hear another turkey on, in the other direction and fly off the roost to it. So you want the turkey or the gobbler to know that there is another turkey in the area. So start with the soft tree calls, and they'll sound like this. Again, we'll give you a few tree calls. Again, remember the important thing here is slow and a low call. Don't get too excited or too fast with it. Make it real slow and real low. After the turkey has come out of the roost, assuming that he, you can tell by the way he gobbles that he's come out of the roost, or you might even be close enough where you see him fly down or you hear him fly down and hit the ground, you begin calling softly. If you've heard him hit the ground, he's still fairly close to you. You don't want to call real loud. Sometimes this frightens turkeys as much as it brings them to you. We like to start with a series of yelps, but at the same time you want to be excited. An old hen, when she's ready to get on with the breeding process, is going to be fairly excited. So when you start your yelping, they'll be fairly quick yelps, but they don't need to be real loud. You might start your yelp with, and sound something similar to this. These are just basic yelps then that you'll start using once the turkey flies to the ground.
Okay, I'm going to use a little bit different call. I'm going to use a, a call with two diaphragms, and Tommy's been using what we call a raspy D. I'm going to use a call with a little higher pitch. Pitch most of the time is not effective turkey. Uh, sometimes we like to use put a call on each side of a mouth, a diaphragm calling, and try to get a turkey excited by thinking there are two hens in the same area. I'm going to use a little bit different type of call. It's going to sound a little different, but turkeys are like people. And their voices are all different. So we sort of remember that when you hear Tom and I call and it's taped back and forth. We're using different type of calls and we use different rhythms, but they still sound like turkeys. So this is what I would do when I, on my first series of calls to a bird. I'm going to cluck a little bit, yelp a little bit, see how he responds. I'm going to respond again in turn to how he does. If he gobbled back to my first couple of clucks, I'd give him a little bit of time to come closer and see what he's going to do. If he's hard to move, if he doesn't want to move, he stands in one place and gobble, you can either almost quit calling altogether, you can just pour it on and call every 15 or 20 seconds again. Like Tom said, when a hen wants to get bred, she's not going to sit quiet and yelp three times every 15 minutes. She's going to make some noise. He's, she's going to let him know she's interested. So we call a, a good bit. And depending on the way the turkey responds, if he responds immediately, responds real loud, maybe double gobbles, we're not going to call that much because he's telling us he's coming right now. But again, if he's very hesitant, doesn't need much, we pretty much pour it on him. Uh, another good call to use when you uh, when a bird hangs up on you if a bird won't come is a cackle. Uh, the last few years, a cackle has really been overdone. Uh, we did an article four or five years ago, six years ago, in one of the magazines about the use of the cackle and People have just gone crazy with it. Uh, it's a good call when it's not overused. Some areas it's, it's used so much and so often and turkeys don't even pay any attention to it. But we do everything else first. We'll cluck and yelp and, and purr and, and do a whole lot of different sequences. And if the bird won't move with those, a cackle and uh, some of the other the more advanced callings are sort of a last resort. If you cackle when a bird first comes out of a tree and he doesn't come then, well, you've used your best weapon and you all have nothing left in your arsenal. So. Remember that when you, and be a little bit discreet when you use the cackle, uh, especially in a bird that's been hunting a lot and has been, been worried a lot. If you do a lot of calling to him, he's probably going to be call shy. Tommy hit a couple licks on the cackle here, and I'll come back with my version of it. On the cackle, this is not a call that you want to use just by itself. Usually we'll either have a few soft yelps going into the cackle or we'll cackle and then end up with a few soft yelps. But... The cackle that I'll use will sound something like this when I'm hunting in the woods. I'm a little wild, a little crazy in Tommy is that thing, so I really get it cranked up sometimes. I, I sometimes double and triple cackle and just beat and thrash around like I'm the wildest uh, hen in the woods and sometimes that'll get an old guy turned on it otherwise won't do much but I'll, I'll use a little higher pitch and then use a little more stuff with it sometimes in a, in a, in a sequence it sounds uh, just as excited as I can sound Cackles a call it. that you want to sound excited with. You want to really get things moving with him. You're getting gold gobbler excited. Get him excited as he can possibly be. Uh, it's a tremendous call when it's used in the, in the proper sequence in the right time. And it can, it can be a detrimental call if you use it at the wrong time. Uh, another call we like to use, and, and when a bird, as Tom said a few minutes ago, when a bird gets in close, we'll cluck and purr to him. We use this call in combination with whines. He's in a lot of different sequences. But when a turkey gets in 50 or 60 yards, it gets almost in sight. It's the last little extra that br brings him on sometimes, and a cluck and purr can do that for you occasionally. And again, we'll both do that. Uh, you can use 100 different sequ sequences with it. Everybody has their favorite.
one thing that we may have neglected to point out here, if you're a beginning caller, don't feel that you have to learn to do all of these calls before you go in the woods. Jim's pointed this out as we've gone through the tape, but the basic yelp and the basic cluck are what you need to start with. These, as Jim pointed out, are also icing on the cake, and there are other calls that we'll get into later in the tape that will also help you in this situation. If the turkey hangs up or he's not responding the way you would like him to, uh, we'll get into calls that you can use also in this situation later on. But supposing that you were fortunate enough that the turkey responded and he started in to you, the final thing that we want to remind you of and go over with you is getting ready to make the actual killing shot. It's more to it than just picking the gun up and firing it. Uh, as we pointed out earlier in the tape, turkeys do have extremely keen vision. And for that reason, once the turkey comes into view, you want to try to avoid any movement at all. Anytime his head is in view, he can pick up any slight movements that you make. So if your gun's pointing two inches to the left of where he is, and you try to move over to get on target, he's going to pick that movement up. And we suggest that before he gets into sight, you try to be pointing your gun as nearly as possible in the direction you think he's coming from. And if you find that he circles around, comes in from behind you, don't move while he's in sight. Let him walk behind a tree or maybe even let him walk down over the edge of the ridge or out of sight and then try to call him back. But once you've spooked the bird or uh, something's happened to make him flush off, then it's going to be very difficult to get him to gobble anymore or to respond to your calls the rest of the day. But as long as his head is in sight or as long as he can see you, you don't want to have any type of movement whatsoever. And this is a very important point, I think, this has probably cost turkey hunters more birds in the woods than anything else they've done wrong. You can make a mistake on the call. You can set up in the wrong position. Uh, there are a hundred things you can do wrong while you're in the woods, but the, all you have to do is to move one time, and this is going to ruin your chances of getting a bird in the spring or fall or any time of the year. These are some of the basic things that you need to keep in mind when spring hunting. We cannot in any possible way cover all the things that you'll come across while you're in the woods. Through experience you're going to find that things will happen to you that no one can ever explain or uh, ever anticipate happening to you in the woods. You're going to become much better as you experience these things firsthand. After you've had some success in spring hunting, maybe you want to go to a state where there's fall hunting if your state doesn't have fall hunting, or maybe your state has fall hunting and you want to try this. At this time, we will get into just some of the basic fundamentals again of fall hunting, and Jim will start out on this, giving you some of the basic strategy that we use, and it has brought us some success hunting in the fall of the year. Okay, the basic thing we're trying to do in the fall is we're hunting young birds that are in flocks. Uh, what we call birds of the year, jakes and jennies, whatever terminology you want to use for them. But you're basically hunting an old hen and her poults, or two or three old hens and their poults. Perhaps in flocks of as many as 25 or 30, or as in a few as in number as maybe six or seven. But your basic strategy in the fall is to find these birds, break up the flocks, sit down at the break site where the birds were flushed from and then call the birds back in. That is a basic fall hunting strategy. And it, it gets modified obviously uh, back and forth at different, in different uh, sets of circumstances but by and large that's what you're interested in doing. The, uh, the basic thing you want to do is find the birds. You can hunt in areas where you find a lot of scratching, uh, feathers around the edges of fields, uh, turkey droppings, uh, these are all things we can look for. Food sources, uh, wild cherry, grapes, acorns, uh, grasshoppers are excellent late summer and early fall foods. Wherever the food is, generally speaking, that's where the birds are going to be. Let's say that you have found a flock of birds, you have successfully broken them up, which is not easy to do always. We could talk 20 minutes on the incorrect and the correct ways to break up flocks of turkeys. 
but you want to break them up as many different directions as possible. Yell, shoot, scream, whatever you can do to get the bird successfully separated as far apart as you possibly can. Turkeys are very gregarious. They like to be together. They like to be in their flock, in their group. And when they're in this situation, they're confident and secure. When they're not, they're looking for the company of another turkey. And that's where you, the hunter, come in. So again, your basic strategy is to break that flock. And you set up similar to the way you do in the spring once the flock is broken, with your back against a tree larger than your body, facing the direction you expect the bird to come, or birds to come, and with no movement at all. Basic calls are the same as they are in the spring. Cluck and the yelp. Again, we do the same things. We, we expect birds to uh, respond to these calls, to uh, call back to us in a like manner in the spring. Gobblers will gobble back to almost all these calls for you. In the fall, we do what the birds do. If the birds yelp, we yelp. If the birds cluck, we cluck. A uh, call that we haven't talked about yet is the kiki. And it's, a, it's an excellent call to use in the spring at times. It's more of a fall call than a spring call. And a kiki is a, a lost call of a young bird. They're just torn all to pieces because they're lost. They can't find the rest of the flock. And this is the, a pleading type call. You have to put some emotion in this call if you're, if you're a caller. Uh, the diaphragm call is by far the best call to make this call on. Very, very difficult to make in any other type of a call. The kiki is always, almost always thrown in with other calls. The kikis and yelps, uh, kikis and clucks, again, combination calling. To make the kiki in a diaphragm, say the word TT with the call in position, or say the word PP with the call in position. I'll do both of those and sound, show you how the kiki should sound in the fall. High pitched and lost and terrified. can't stress rhythm enough. It's, it's that little key, 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 the sound that you want to hear from those lost birds. Tom will give you a few key keys and make a few more comments about your basic fall hunting strategy. Let me give you the key key first here. question that we get a lot of times is how long do you wait before calling and where do you set up once you've broken a flock of turkeys. We found and most people will recommend that you set up somewhere close to the flush site or the break site. It doesn't have to be exactly, you have to, we found through experience, study the terrain around you. If you break the turkeys up in a hollow, it might be that they'll gather on one of the ridges above you. Or if you break them up in some heavy brush, they might, or in the open woods, they might go to the brush together or some thicker place. And you'll just have to study the terrain around you as far as where to position. Once you've found a likely spot where the birds will travel to try to get back together, as to how long you wait to begin calling, we usually let the birds make the first call. If the birds start calling within 10 minutes, then we'll start calling. Uh, sometimes it, it depends again how often they've been flushed and how much pressure they've had as to how soon they will begin calling. There have been times when we've had to wait as long as an hour before any bird made the first sound. But this again will come through experience. You don't want to break the birds up and sit right down the same spot and begin calling right away. I don't think you're going to have very much success doing this. Let the birds kind of set the pace and dictate as to when you'll begin calling. And then, as far as what calls to use, we try to call exactly like they're calling. If 
they're using a lot of key keys, then we'll key key. If they're just clucking to get back together, then we'll try to cluck and use pretty much the same calls that the birds are using. We have found there are times when the birds flushed, they got back together by scratching, especially when the leaves are dry on a still day, they'll get together by scratching and won't make a sound. And we'll cover this a little bit later on some of the special techniques that you can use in hunting. But this is one technique that you might use in hunting in the fall. Okay, we'd like to say just a couple things about hunting old gobblers in the fall. That's probably the most difficult type of turkey hunting. Uh, it's only for the most dedicated hunters. You might spend two or three weeks in the, in the turkey woods in the fall and not even see an old gobbler. They run in flocks like the young birds do, and they're very, very difficult to stalk and very, very difficult to locate. Even harder than that to break apart. But if you are fortunate enough to find a group of old gobblers and get them separated, they make two basic calls in the fall. They gobble a little bit, uh, not real, real often. But they use what we call an old gobbler yelp. One or two yelps every 10 or 15 minutes would be very talkative for them indeed. Uh, they also cluck. They'll cluck once or twice every 10 or 15 minutes, again, depending on the situation. But that's sometimes how they regroup. Oftentimes they won't regroup for two or three hours after they've been flushed, and almost always in mountainous terrain, They'll, they'll regroup above, on ground above where they were flushed. So if you flush them halfway up a mountain, you might as well go three or 400 yards above the flush site to start calling. Some, it, again, it depends on the situation. It uh, depends on how much they've been hunted and how wild they are. But generally speaking, that's what we do. And we give it a minimum of three-hour wait after we break a flock of old gobblers. So I'll give you some old gobbler yelps. They're very difficult to make. Uh, they're very deep and coarse, and the cluck is the same way out. Yelp like an old gobbler a few times, and then I'll give you some clucks. Again, the sequence is very wide spaced, and very, very seldom do they call more than once every 10 or 15 minutes. So you can get a general idea from that. It's a much deeper, coarser type calling than you would use on other birds in the fall or in the spring. Just a few notes here on equipment. The most important part of equipment that you have is your boots. Wear good footwear. Wear the best boots you can afford. The lightest boots because chances are you'll be doing a lot of walking. Um, camouflage. Needless to say, everything must be camouflage. We naturally wear camouflage clothing, but uh, gloves are very important. Your hands and your face and your weapon will move before anything else. So make sure your face is covered either with camouflage paint or a mask. Your hands are covered with some type of a glove. And we think it's very important to camouflage your gun. We use camouflage tape or camouflage netting for that. We always take pruning shears in the woods with us. They have a million different uses. Anything from cutting down brush around your select calling site to helping you clean birds. You'll find more uses for them the longer you use them. A good sharp knife, needless to say, should be included in your equipment. A uh, strap for carrying your bird if you're fortunate enough to, to bag one. An old piece of rope will even do, but it's always handy to have something like that. And while we're talking about uh, uh, carrying a bird out of the woods, it's always better to have some kind of a, a fluorescent cover for the bird or a piece of fluorescent cloth that you can put on yourself somewhere to identify yourself as a hunter and not... Uh, an, a, a turkey you can be shot by an overzealous hunter. Uh, compass is, is always good to have if you're hunting strange, strange areas. They've saved our bacon more than once in hunting in different states. Uh, extra calls obvious, for obvious reasons, but we like to carry more than one call at all times. And you never can tell you might misplace one or, or lose one in the woods and you'll always have one. Uh, let me turn this thing over to Tom a little bit on safety. Uh, Needless to say, uh, the worst thing that p could possibly happen to you would be for you to be a casualty in the woods or make someone else uh, a casualty. So he'll speak to you briefly on some safety tips. I just want to take a few minutes to mention something about safety and the, while you're turkey hunting. One of the states at this time is doing some experimentation with flame orange or fluorescent orange 
while turkey hunting. Uh, they use this while going through the woods, any movement that they have to do from one position to the other when carrying the bird out of the woods and also while sitting they're tying a ribbon of fluorescent orange uh, above their heads and this is to let other turkey hunters know that there is a hunter in their area. Um, here again you don't want be, to be mistaken for a turkey. Other hunters may shoot at sight they may, or movement, they may shoot at sound and we want something there to warn them that there is another turkey hunter in the area. While you're in the woods, do everything within your power to be a safe hunter yourself and also to ensure that other turkey hunters that you may be hunting with are safe hunters, that they're doing things safely. One slogan that I used when I used to teach woodshop was that a few words of apology is a poor payment for an accident that you could have prevented. And there are a lot of things that you can do to prevent accidents. One thing that we would ask you to do is to wait until you see the beard of the turkey before you shoot. Since only bearded turkeys are legal in most states, especially in the spring season, wait until you're positive of what the target is before you pull the trigger. Don't be shooting at sound or movement. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, some more advanced calling. Uh, one of the first things, probably the hardest call to make on any type of a call and make it very realistically, and I've never heard anybody do what I would call an outstanding job is uh, the gobble of the turkey. It's not used very often. It's sometimes used in the spring to stimulate an old Tom to be jealous and come running in and try to run his rival off. But it's it can be made in several different ways. We're going to run through about three or four different uh, items you can use to gobble with. But uh, probably the most effective one and and sounds as good or better than anything else is a natural voice. I don't have the world's greatest gobble, but uh, I'm going to hit a couple of licks here on it anyway and show you what it sounds like a little bit with the natural voice. Then Tom will gobble on the tube for you and we'll, uh, we'll go also gobble on a diaphragm collar for you. But it, it's a difficult call to reproduce. It's uh, We sometimes think it's even not even worth the trouble to learn to gobble, but it, it can be effective sometimes. But it is by far the most dangerous call to use when you're in the woods because when somebody hears that call, they're going to think turkey right away. And we've had people approach us while we've been trying to gobble up a bird sometimes, even in the fall. It works It works pretty well in the fall sometimes. So keep that in mind if you choose to use this call. So let me hit it a couple licks with a natural voice. Give me about two to get started with, but uh, as I said, it's pretty difficult to do. Okay, Tom will gobble on them. On a shaker tube here, and then we'll come back and gobble on a diaphragm call for you. gobble Tommy did was on a, on a snuff can. It's a, it's a real good gobble if you can learn to master the thing. Another thing we like to do is, in what we call advanced calling, is, is what we call cuts and clucks. Uh, this is a very effective call to make with uh, in the spring when an old gobbler hangs up or he won't come. A very excited cutting, clucking type sound. And again, we use these as a last resort, but they are very, very effective sometimes. I'll do them and then Tom will follow the set. Real loud, real scratchy, just anything to sound excited. Some people will tell you that this, this is the alarm call of the turkey. It's the alarm call of the turkey only if you do it two or three times and then quit. You know, if you keep it up, it's, it's an excitement call. It's an alarm call. I think in the fall, up in the spring, it denotes excitement, especially sexual excitement from a hen. Gobblers really get cranked up with it. If you don't hear him gobble in the spring, 
just cut and cluck to him real fast like that, and he'll surprise you. Um, one call we've already talked about is a kiki. Uh, it's a sort of an advanced type call. It's difficult to do, but it's a, it's a call that you have to practice to be proficient with. I'll do a couple of series with that, and I'll let Tom go into what we call a lost call. Uh, some people think a kiki is a lost is a lost bird call, but this lost call is something else. It so when a turkey's completely totally lost, he really gets to yelp and he yelps 14, 15, 20 times in a row and gets louder and faster as he goes. So I'll do a kiki for you first, then Tom will come in with a lost call. There are also some tricks and things that have sort of been passed down through the years. You don't hear too much about that. They're real effective turkey takers sometimes. And there are five or six of these things we like to pass on to you. Uh, sometimes you can use them to turn the tide in your favor. It might be one little tiny thing that you can do to bring that old boy the last 40 or 50 yards. Uh, one of these things is, as Tom mentioned earlier, when a old bird gets close and the leaves are dry, sometimes he expects to hear that hen walking around. If he can hear it, you can't see him, but you could hear him walking. And he won't come on in, you're sure he can hear you. Reach over and scratch in the leaves behind you with a twig or a stick or with three fingers. I try to sound like a turkey scratching. Sometimes it doesn't take too much. We've done it on the other side of a tree, and sometimes a bird will just come running. And it's, it's a type of communication between turkeys. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but we've had a lot of success with that at different times. It won't always work. Nothing will always work. But it's a good thing to try if you're in desperation and bird's hung up and you can't bring him. Try that little scratch in the leaves one time. Um... Another thing, the second thing we like to talk about is a, what we call a fly down sound. It's the sound of a, a hen flying down. An old god where sometimes expects to hear her fly down. He won't fly down to hear so leave the limb. And you can take your hunting hat or beat your hands against your coat. I'm going to use a hat right now. Take an old type of hunting hat and just thrash it against your body to imitate the sound of a hen flying down. And it should sound like this. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but it's close enough, I think, to fool a bird that's out to 100, 125 yards. And you don't extend it. You don't carry it out for any length of time. Just enough to sound like a bird leaving a tree. Another technique that we use is the walkaway technique. And this is to give the old gobbler the impression that someone is walking away from him. He couldn't stand to have that old hen walk away and leave him by himself. And we do this without actually moving a lot of times. And you can do it by calling toward the gobbler and then turn your head away from the gobbler and call softer. This will give him the impression that you're leaving him, you're going off in the opposite direction. And it'll sound something similar to this. Call toward him and then turn and call away from him. Another trick we picked up a couple of years ago from an old fellow down in, in West Virginia was when the leaves are real dry in the fall or the spring. So fasten a, about a foot or a foot and a half of dog chain on the back of each boot, just a, a small length type dog chain, fasten around the boot and drag it through the woods with you. It sounds much more like a turkey walking than a man. It gets a little shuffle type effect. And it doesn't seem to scare birds as much as if you were trying to sneak along. And it sounds like, it sound more like a human, but this dragging, shuffling type effect the chains behind does do a, a good job sometimes of sound like one or two or three even more turkeys shuffling around feeding in the woods. Another thing you can do is to change calls. If you work the bird with a diaphragm call or with a certain pitch diaphragm, switch to another call. Switch to a box or a slate or a snuff can or anything which sounds different, which, which might make him think there's more than one turkey there. Sometimes we'll use a slate and maybe two different diaphragms that sound like maybe a whole flock of turkeys in the area, in, in the area where he thinks there's a hen. And it's very, very effective sometimes. 
Uh, another thing you can do is to move on a bird. Circle like a hen. Move right, move left, move back. Uh, a lot of times when a bird's been worked a, uh, a long time by a stationary hunter, he sort of gets suspicious of something that stays in the same spot. That's one of the ways that we're able to tell a man who can call real well in the woods from a turkey. A hen won't stay in the same spot for just a few minutes at the most. You know, she'll be constantly moving and calling. And we suspect in the areas where gobblers are heavily hunted, they catch on to this pretty quick. Okay, the next portion of our tape is going to be some recordings we made of live birds in the last few years. You'll hear some, some diaphragm yelping, you'll hear some box calling, you'll hear some live birds calling. You can probably identify very easily the, the bogus calls, the diaphragm calls, and the box calls, because they'll be much closer to the microphone than the live birds. This first section will be a, an old hen that walked up to Tom a couple of years ago, and as she was coming in, he yelped to her and she yelped back to an old goblin and distance gobbled. You have to listen very carefully to hear him, but I think you'll be interested in this. It's about 15 or 20 seconds. This next piece of footage here was when we picked up a year or so ago. It was a lost bird. It was really lost. Unfortunately, we run a little bit low on tape. But you get a good idea of what a wild bird sounds like when he's lost. This is a set of key keys from a wild bird. Okay, that second piece of footage you heard right there was a flock of birds we got under in the roost. We found them the night before and got right under them the next morning. And those were some real soft tree yelps and tree calls with a couple of clucks. And that's basically what you're going to hear from a flock early in the morning or from an old hen. That, that real slow tree talk. Okay, you've heard the early morning tree yelps as a flock is in the tree. Uh, the next thing you're going to hear is a flock feeding on the ground about 20 minutes after they've come out of the trees. This was even before the season. This is what they sound like. This will give you an idea of some of the different rhythm, rhythms and pitches of the birds as you would hear them in the natural woods.
Okay, we hope we've saved the best to last for you. If you're a spring hunter, I hope you'll, you'll certainly appreciate what you hear. What we have here in the last cut, and Tom got this a couple of years ago, you're going to also hear a few distractions like trucks, and I'm sure you've heard a plane already. But there are three mature gobblers coming in at about 18 feet, and they, get in, they come in from about 100 yards, and they get in about 18 feet, and they see Tom. And you're going to hear those alarm clocks right at the end. Uh, we hope you've learned a little bit from listening to this tape. We've certainly enjoyed making it. And when you think turkey calls, especially diaphragm calls, we hope you'll think perfection. Good luck and good hunting.